Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then they hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, Invicta Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Dr. Leon, and as usual, I hope you, your family, whether you live in the States or internationally, you are doing fine for yourself, you are healthy, things are doing well for yourself during this era of uncertainty with social distancing, but hopefully everything's going well for you, and I'm a wee bit happy here because California, which is where I reside at, it's going through it's going through currently phase two of reopening. So if you do live in California, things are getting a little bit more better for uh, things are getting a little bit more better for you people over here. If you live in the states and um, your state is planning to reopen up sometime in the middle of May or early June, then good for you. But here in California, probably things are going to get back on track and be normal again. Probably the entirety of America is going to be um, right on track to getting more normal again around August. So. Fingers crossed, everything goes back <laughs> goes back to normal. So this is being reported in from BJPan.com that UFC President Dana White has confirmed the world's leading MMA promotion will be holding an upcoming event on May 23 in Las Vegas, Nevada. The UFC is scheduled to hold events on May 9, May 13, and May 16 in Jacksonville, Florida, and many assume the promotion would continue to hold its events there until the coronavirus pandemic subsides. But according to Dana White, the UFC is already targeting its return to its home base of Las Vegas very soon. Speaking to Sports Illustrated, White said the UFC plans on holding a show in Las Vegas on May 23. This is quoted here from Dana White. While everybody was effing lying out by, out by the pool, hanging out and doing whatever the f they want, they're, do, they're doing in quarantine, we're here, uh, we're, we're, we're in here effing grinding, man. Fighting crazy, or fighting crazy wars every day put it, to put on the first event, we pulled it off. We are going to be able to hold this thing earlier and they ask us to stand down. Now, we're going Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, and I don't think I've told anybody this yet. We're going to come back to Vegas and put on a fight May 23, White said. There were no other details shared by Dana White, but one would assume that promotion plans on holding the May 23rd event at the UFC Apex Center. The card is rumored to be headlined by a welterweight bout featuring top contenders Tyron Woodley and Gilbert Burns. However, even White wants... The May 23 card to happen in Las Vegas, there's still the matter of the Nevada State Athletic Commission clearing the event to take place. That is pretty interesting that Dana White says, we are going to have an event happen in, uh, happen in this area, but we're still unsure if it's even legal for us to even have the event, but that's where I want the event to happen. So they're, they're working on it. At the moment, there are no events allowed to be held in Nevada as at this moment. While, clearly, uh, while White clearly believes he'll be able to change the commission's mind, and with the event just two weeks away, he will need an answer soon. What do you think of Dino White's announcement of May 23 UFC event will take place in Las Vegas? I think it would be nice if it did take place in the Apex Center, and if you, if um the Las Ve- if the Nevada Athletic Commission were to follow the guidelines that were displayed for the Florida Athletic Commission, then they definitely can do a show in the UFC. All they gotta do is to, uh, so to make this event, I think, to be legal, um, to be legal and for it to be passed through, is if you don't, if you don't have it be accessible to the public. Just have it be a private event. Kinda like the Brasilia show that happened, to which it was just, um, you, you got camera crew, you got camera crew, you got the referee, you got the announcer, you've got the, the crew people, you've got the fighters, and that's about it. Plus also, uh, the Apex facility is also fairly really small. So you're not so don't don't expect this like huge arena that most people would generally go to, where they can go like potentially be sick. I don't really think so, because uh, in fact it's in their own headquarters. I don't really see much of an issue for it happening in Las Vegas, 
But you know what? Anything can happen. E- even if they aren't able to go and say, hey, okay, so we can't have the event in Las Vegas, even though I want the event to happen in Las Vegas. We're just going to have it in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. The good thing about the UFC right now is that they have an official location where they can go and do their shows. Yes, it won't be as... It wouldn't be as extravagant as as it would be if it were in Vegas, or it wouldn't be as easy to control if it were being the UFC Apex um, Apex facility. But you know what? I think Dino you know, should be happy that okay, we got we got our location, we got Jacksonville, Florida. We can do all our shows there until the coronavirus pandemic is over. All right then. Uh, Dana White then later goes on to say about uh, how other people are making allegations toward Dana White, and that the reason why Dana White is doing this is because the guy is really greedy. Dana White re- uh, rebutes us saying that no, this isn't a matter of him being greedy because he has a lot of money. He's doing this because he has the passion to do so. And I agree with Dana White. I don't agree with Dana White with many things, but I agree with Dana White in the fact that I think he's... It's you got to treat Dana White the same way you kind of have to treat Vince McMahon. I know that a lot of people say Vince McMahon is like really greedy and he's like... And he's still doing WWE shows today because he wants to make money. I don't really think so. I think he wants to make these shows because he just doesn't like the idea... Of someone or something stopping him from doing what he wants to do. WWE pretty much, the WWE pro wrestling landscape is Vince McMahon's life. And the same thing applies to Dana White. Dana White, like nobody knows anything that much about Dana White other than the fact that like he pretty much like was working like a deadbeat job until the role of mixed martial arts kind of got to him. And so there's nothing important, there's nothing more important right now to Dana White other than his family than the world of mixed martial arts and the UFC. So this truly is a passion project for him. This is a challenge for him um, that's challenging his passion for him to go get all these shows going on. Dana White has recently mentioned, actually, that uh, in a conference call with the president and alongside with several other commissioners that included Adam Silver and Roger Gale from the NBA and the NFL, that he says that himself and Vince McMahon are the only two people who are ballsy enough to go against uh, coronavirus and still continue pushing forward with their product and their plans. And so, so um, when someone says, oh man, Dana White, he's he's greedy, uh, he's greedy and selfish. Like, one might, a lot of fighters would say that he is a selfish person, but I wouldn't say that he's greedy. I would say that he's got a big head and that he's like really stubborn, but I wouldn't say that he's greedy. I think there's no reason for Dana White. Is Dana White, how much money is Dana White even making from these empty arena UFC shows? Not really that much, really. Uh, I'm pretty sure not that much, considering the fact that he's made a lot of money already coming in from the Zufa deal. So, yeah, I, I, he's he's got the money. The, the dude can retire right now, and he'll be like, you know what? I can retire right now, just stay home for the next 30, 40 years, and I'm all good. Like, the Inuit is pretty much set for life at this point. There's absolutely zero reason why he needs to go and keep pushing for UFC shows. But he wants to continue pushing these shows because he's very passionate about this. He wants to, he wants, I guess he likes the idea of being the one who always pushes forward while everyone is in the back. That, that's what, that's what his mentality is similar to Vince McMahon. He always wants to be the trailblazer. He wants to always, he wants to always be ahead. And, um, that, that's, that is how, how, what Dana White, uh, prioritizes. He wants to be ahead of the curve more than anyone else. Even if, it might not be the best decision, though. That's what he wants. So this is coming in from ESPN, Ariel Hawani on Dominic Cruz's future and the future of the heavyweight title picture. And so um, he goes on about Dominic Cruz. Uh, he goes on about Dominic Cruz and like what his role will, has, his role will be, him coming up rustiness and what he can expect in his matchup against Henry Cejudo, uh, Ariel Hawani, uh, Chael Sonnen, and other um, experts in the MMA field, uh, including former fighters and analysts, all say Dominic Cruz doesn't really deserve this title fight. That's the general consensus. Even all the other, even Cruz's colleagues all say, hey, Cruz doesn't deserve this fight. He really doesn't. But he has name notoriety. And he's a former champion. So that automatically bypasses normal standards for a usual fighter to go and get a title shot. And uh, and then uh, Dominic Cruz is training really well for himself. Uh, he had, Dominic Cruz is coming in as a major underdog in this fight. It'll be a fun story if he were to win, but from what I'm seeing right now, uh, there is no chance of... Okay, I'm not saying there is no chance. I'm saying there's very little chance of Dominic Cruz beating Henry Cejudo. Um, after this portion of the podcast, I'll go into detail about each matchup in the UFC 249 card, and I'll talk about why I think some fighters will have the advantage, and why and how some fighters are going to the fights as the underdog. 
Um, Ariel Hwani then goes on about the heavyweight title picture, and it is speculated that it's going to be Stipe Miocic versus Daniel Cormier, and I definitely think that is the right matchup. Uh, Daniel Cormier defeated Stipe Miocic, and Miocic uh, won the rubber match. And so for uh, and so for Miocic versus Cormier, that is the best ma- that is the best matchup because I believe that these two, it could go either way. Really, it really can. Cormier took everybody surprise when he defeated Miocic, and then Miocic took everyone surprise when he defeated Cormier in the second fight. And really, I personally believe that uh, Cormier came in with the wrong strategy in that se- in that second fight. I think he got way too confident in a striking ability when he really shouldn't have, and those body pu- punches that Miocic gave onto Cormier in the second fight took uh, took its toll. So in this third fight, it could be anyone's game. It really can. Um, I hopefully Cormier can go and utilize his wrestling strategy a lot more than his striking. Yes, he knocked out Miocic, but you know what? The second time going, it didn't work out well. And so, coming up after the short break here, we'll be discussing UFC 249 Fight Preview, coming up right here at the GSMC MMA Podcast. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. And welcome back. So, UFC 249 preview. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the matchups. Let's see who's going to win these fights. Let's talk about the predictions here. What can we expect from UFC 249? UFC 249 is going to be happening this Saturday, and I'm going to be watching it. Hopefully, you guys will be watching it with me online. And so, let's talk about the main event first. Tony Ferguson versus Justin Gaethje. This really is who the immovable object versus the unstoppable force. Justin Gaethje versus Ferguson is for the interim lightweight title, which is very interesting considering the fact that Khabib Nurmagomedov he's expect he, I guess he expects he expects to come back by September, just a couple just just less than five months away. He says he's prepped up and ready to go fight five months away. And if Ferguson or Gaethje were to win this fight, they have just a short five four four or five months. To prep up against probably the best lightweight champion of all time. And so, whoever would just fight, they got another war coming up in just a couple months, really. So, Tony Ferguson versus Justin Gaethje. Uh, it was very questionable on why this was considered an interim title bout. But if you're to look at the matchup here of Tony Ferguson versus Gaethje and Henry Cejudo versus Dominic Cruz here. Yes, uh, Henry Cejudo versus Dominic Cruz has a lot in stake here. It's the returning, it's the returning former champion fighting against a, a two-division champion in Henry Cejudo. 
I, wait, oh no, Henry Cejudo, he just gave up recently his um, his other belt here. So it's going to be just Cruz versus Henry Cejudo. And Henry Cejudo and Cruz, they're both big names. They really are, though. The only problem with that, though, is that Cruz is coming off uh, after a loss. And also, he's been gone from the game for about four years. And so he's not right now, he's right now not relevant. He's not been relevant in the past four years in the world of mixed martial arts. Other than the fact that just him, like, doing some analyst stuff and doing some news reporting. But for Gaethje versus Ferguson, man, Ferguson's coming into this fight as the favorite, and I can see why Ferguson is is the favorite. If you've been following Ferguson through his social media and through reports and seeing and seeing how his training has, has been going, Ferguson it has been dead focused on trying to go and win this fight. He really is. Even even if it's not Khabib Nurmagomedov, just Gaethje stylistically wise is just a better matchup for Ferguson. And I think when it comes to um, point and accumulation over five rounds, I really do believe Tony Ferguson can go and defeat Justin Gaethje here. Uh, the last time Tony Ferguson had a struggle with somebody would be about Kevin Lee. And Gaethje is definitely a step up higher on to, uh, over Kevin Lee. But Tony Ferguson's uh, ability to, uh, ability to uh, have a comeback uh, have a comeback in that fight and the fact that he's been constantly developing overall as a striker, as a grappler uh, for, the, uh, for the past couple of years, I really do think that Ferguson has all the tools to go defeat Justin Gaethje. And so, and also, uh, considering the fact that Justin Gaethje, he's only had about five weeks of prep time. Yes, Tony Ferguson has has had five weeks of prep time against Gaethje, but Ferguson has been training for years, years, prepping up against Khabib Nurmagomedov, one of the best champions in the history of UFC. While Gaethje, while Gaethje, um, so so Ferguson has been in fight shape. Uh, <laughs> Ferguson was able to get to one fifty, uh, was able to get to his uh, weight limit. Five weeks ago, which is like insane to think about. Like, dude, oh my gosh, you're you're that committed that you are you're that committed to the weight loss and to your training program that you're willing to go cut all the weights and get to your exact weight for the lightweight division, even though your fight is until a couple weeks away. That is intensity right there. That is serious stuff. And so for Ferguson versus Gaethje, what I imagine here would be because because Justin Gaethje is one of the most exciting fires to watch and when i say exciting exciting in the sense that this guy pretty much is a walking tank i think he's had seven performance of the night bonuses in the in his past eight fights and all those uh, yeah he's had like seven performance of the night bonuses in his past eight fights while tony ferguson is not as much as seven but every time you saw ferguson fight his fight against pettis was absolutely bonkers uh, so if you want to go see like two people go duke it out in the most exciting po- possible way where you'll you know here's Ferguson versus Gaethje reminds me a lot of is gonna remind me a lot of Stephen Bonner versus Forrest Griffin. It it really is, except a lot more pretty to watch, really. So, uh, well, uh, yeah, yeah. For Ga- for Gaethje, I don't Ga- when it comes to striking, Gaethje is far far not in the same boat as Ferguson. I could be wrong here. I uh, I really could be wrong. But when it comes to like striking ability, for uh, Justin Gaethje's boxing is really good, but. Tony Ferguson is exceptional at fighting all these strange angles, going uh, going for kicks, trying to find all these like weird ways he can go and slowly take down uh, Justin Gaethje. But while well, Gaethje, here's the, here's the issue with Gaethje though, is that because of the fact that he's a walking tank, he has a tendency of like putting his guard down. And when I mean putting his guard, down, I mean like his all his opponents will always always. Uh, throw more accumulative strikes than Gaethje in all, in all these in all the um, in all the exchanges. It, the reason why Gaethje always ends up defeating his opponents is because of the fact that he just has insane cardio and he can keep it up. He can keep it up for three, five rounds. Keep pushing forward. He can go get pummeled, like he can get punched in the face like three hundred times, and he can still go push forward. And because of that, when it gets towards the third round or fourth round or fifth round, Gaethje uh, can then uh, take advantage of his other opponents like um, poor cardio. And he can go knock them out, or he can go and overwhelm them in the final rounds, which will be good for the ju- for the judge, and that nabs him the decision. But he cannot do that against Ferguson. I really don't, because Ferguson, not only the fact is, court- is Ferguson a complete cardio machine, he's a cardio freak, his striking ability is much more dynamic, much more complex, and much more quicker, much more cleaner than anything that Justin Gaethje has ever fought with in other fights. Gaethje has a tendency of fighting guys who are also boxers, who have the background of a boxing of the boxing style, boxing slash amateur wrestling background. While Ferguson's more like, okay, he can go fight you in the clinch, he can go fight you on the ground, he can fight you through jiu-jitsu, he can fight you through reverse wrestling, he can go take you down, he can go through high kicks, he can go through leg kicks, he can go through body kicks, he can go through body, he can go um, through body shots. Ferguson truly is the complete MMA fighter. He's got more of a diverse game than Gaethje. And so in 
So in every single aspect of the fight game here, I can see uh, I can see Ferguson just outdoing Gaethje in every aspect. Though once again, this is a fight game; anything could happen here. For all we know, Ferguson's being all super confident. He's throwing out elbows. He's throwing he's throwing out Superman punches onto Gaethje. Gaethje's uh, blocking properly, and then he throws a single counter punch. Does a takedown Tony Ferguson, and and even though Tony Ferguson has exceptionally high Jiu Jitsu game. Gaethje can go and start doing some ground and pound onto Ferguson, and for all we know, Gaethje could go win this fight and become the interim lightweight champion. Although that's the the general consensus that that's not going to happen. Definitely, anything can happen in the UFC, and just think Gaethje can go and lay one, just one good counter right onto Ferguson, go for a takedown, go for some ground and pound, and next thing you know, Gaethje has this fight going on for about all five rounds. It can definitely happen. And so in the end here, I picked Tony Ferguson beating Justin Gaethje through decision after five rounds. That's my prediction. Justin Gaethje is way, way too tough, way too tough to knock out. Uh, though that again, you know, anything can happen in the AFC. For all we know, Gaethje can knock out Tony Ferguson. But I see Tony Ferguson defeating Gaethje through decision after five rounds of him pummeling Gaethje and winning maybe four out of the five rounds. I can see one round where Gaethje can, can might maybe win. But Ferguson is going to go defeat Gaethje through unanimous decision. That's my prediction of the fights. And then after, and then afterwards, here's the interesting part here. Gaethje seriously has nothing to lose off this fight. He really doesn't. Because if Gaethje were to defeat Ferguson, he would then go have the title fight against, um, against Khabib Nagarmadov. And then probably sometime early next year, he can go fight either Ferguson or, uh, Khabib again. And here's the thing. Whether or not he wins or loses, that doesn't change much, really. It really does. The only thing that changes between a Gaethje losing or winning will be whether or not he gets the actual legitimate title shot early, earlier than he should have. It's uh, Gaethje is gonna fight for the title. That's fact. Gaethje is gonna fight for the title. I as early as as five months from now, probably September, or he fights early next year. And it's going to be either Ferguson or Khabib. So if Gaethje loses to Ferguson, and then it uh, Gaethje loses to Ferguson, he can go fight a Conor McGregor or he, uh, Conor McGregor. And I think a lot of people would predict Justin Gaethje defeating Conor McGregor. And then by early next year, he can go fight either Ferguson or Khabib. No matter what, though, Gaethje is pretty much slotted in for being the fourth guy, the three or the third or fourth guy who can go and mix up in a light division, who can go fight for a title, or can be a top contender. So really, Gaethje doesn't have anything to lose here. If he does lose against Tony Ferguson, all he's missing out is that he doesn't get, he doesn't get the title fight five months from now. But he pretty much can get the title fight early next year. And if Gaethje were to win this fight, he just gets the title fight a lot sooner. And so, you know, here's another thing also. Gaethje, he only has five weeks prep time. He only has five weeks of prep up against one of the best fighters in the entire world in Tony Ferguson. So if he loses, he loses because he only has five weeks prep time. If he wins, then good on him. <laughs> so good for Justin Gaethje. He's coming into a fight with almost nothing to lose here except uh, possibly being in a fight of the night contender here against Tony Ferguson. And I can't wait. So you listen to the GSMC MMA podcast and come back right after the short break here. We're going to look into Henry Cejudo versus the returning Dominic Cruz right here at the GSMC MMA podcast. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco, ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to 
designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And welcome back to the podcast here. So, Henry Cejudo is a returning Dominic Cruz for the Bantamweight title. Who's going to win this fight? It's Henry Cejudo. <laughs> uh, it's, it's Henry Cejudo. I just don't really see Dominic Cruz winning this fight, though. Yes, okay. So, Dominic Cruz, he's done this before, where he came back from a major surgery, came back from injury, and after a couple of years in Exodus, he came back and won the title. It has happened in the past. All right, Henry Cejudo is coming to this fight fifteen and two. Dominic Cruz coming is coming into this fight as twenty two and two. And Dominic Cruz, after his performance against Cody Garbrand, I just and yes, okay. So here's the, here's the interesting part about Dominic Cruz. Really, it just the fact that he's been plagued with injuries so many times and so much says that like okay, Dominic Cruz shouldn't win this fight. That's how it is. But Dominic Cruz all the time in his in his recent uh, championship uh, run. Cruz came into his fights all the time being like, okay, so Cruz shouldn't win this fight, but, uh, but he ends up doing it though, surprisingly. And when I look at Dominic Cruz's recent performance against, uh, Cody Garbrand, that really, that really wasn't much of Dominic Cruz being, uh, washed up or not having the skills or not having the ability or even the surgery even like holding back Cruz. I saw it mostly as Cody Garbrand just being the better fighter in that scenario. It really was. If you look at Cruz versus Garbrand, there is no way you can say, Oh, the reason I Cruz lost against Cody Garbrand was because injuries. No, I don't really think so. Cruz was, was was moving really well for himself in the fight against Cody Garbrand. Yes, Cruz has had like overwhelming uh, injuries and surgeries that have plagued him for years. But when you look at the Cruz versus Cody Garbrand matchup, the reason why Garbrand defeated Cruz by decision was because he was a much more cleaner striker. That's a, that really was. Cruz was way too aggressive onto uh, onto Garbrand, and Garbrand's pretty Garbrand pulled out. His best performance of his entire UFC career, fighting so quick, so fast, so precise. I've never seen Garbrandt fight so smart and quick and fast as he's ever did in his entire UFC career against Dominic Cruz. Don, Cody Garbrandt had his best performance ever in his entire career against Cruz. And, and here's the thing: if Garbrandt were to fight Cruz again, like several times, like, like like several times, most likely Cruz would go defeat would defeat Cody Garbrandt. That's what I genuinely believe. If Dominic Cruz were to fight Cody Garbrandt a hundred times, most of the time Dominic Cruz would defeat uh, Cody Garbrandt. But in that instance, Garbrandt defeated Cruz, and it was an instance of injuries plaguing Cruz. It was an instance of Cody Garbrandt just being the much more better fighter for that night. And so, if I were to take that Dominic Cruz, if I were to take the Dominic Cruz uh, champion Dominic Cruz from years ago and move it over towards Henry Cejudo right now, man, because you you can't really think, oh man, Dominic Cruz. Now is better than Dominic Cruz four or five years ago. You, you just can't believe that. So if I were to take the best version of Cruz from four or five years ago, move it over to current day right now and fight against Henry Cejudo, does Dominic Cruz have a chance against Henry Cejudo? The answer is yes. Dominic Cruz has a chance to go and defeat Henry Cejudo after five rounds of action. Do I think it can happen? No. And the reason for that really is, is because Henry Cejudo is incredibly good as it, as it pertains to closing in the distance. Because his Dominic Cruz, all of Dominic Cruz's fights, pretty, pretty, pretty much boils down to him. Po- to pretty much boils down to him poking you, fighting very quick, fighting inside and outside of the pocket, that hitting you with a couple quick jabs, coming out, going for short leg kicks. It, Dominic Cruz prefers the grind out game where he's slowly grinding out for three, five rounds. Uh, Cruz has uh, Cruz and Henry Cejudo have great, have a great gas tank. They can go on for five rounds and keep a consistent pace. Even when Cody Garbrand was pretty much clocking Dominic Cruz in every counterpunch instance, Cruz was still consistent in like trying to establish his game onto Garbrand. Prom though is that Garbrand pretty much got his number for that night. And so if you were to have that Cruz come in against Henry Cejudo, Henry Cejudo is really good at closing in the distance and he'll either go for a takedown 
or he's gonna go or he's gonna shorten the range of distance here and try to go for some like haymakers and like quick jabs closing in distance. Because that's that really is Dominic Cruz's biggest weakness, actually, is the fact that while Cruz is as good as a striker as he is, his he much more prefers fighting out to the pocket. He much he's more of a, a cumulative he's kinda like you want a EHA check to a certain extent. And the fact that she, that he heavily prefers a striking game where he's fighting outside the pocket. He doesn't prefer 50-50 exchanges because every time Cruz matched up with somebody and in his last instance against Cody Garbrand, Cody Garbrand was winning in every 50-50 exchange. And when I say 50-50 exchange, I mean any scenario when both fighters are fighting each other in the middle of the pocket and they're, and they're throwing a 3-5 to five punch hit combo. That's not that's not Cruz's uh, comfort zone. Cruz's comfort zone is coming uh, is coming into your pocket, hitting two jabs, coming out of the pocket, coming in for a leg kick, coming out, coming in, going uh, uh, going for uh, going going for a hesitation, then go for a left right, go for a kick, and off, going for or going again, do another two do, do another two bad, uh, two jab combo, and then with a body kick this time, come out. All of Dominic Cruz's strategy really is. Is coming inside your pocket, hitting you maybe two, three times, ending up with a leg kick or ending up with a body kick, and then coming right out. He can't do that against Henry Cejudo because if you look at Henry Cejudo's performance against TJ Dillashaw, one thing he's really good at is counter punching. He's a really exceptional good counter puncher. And yes, even though Dominic Cruz has the length advantage over Henry Cejudo, here's what Henry Cejudo can do. He can go and bum rush Dominic Cruz, and Henry Cejudo shouldn't fear anything Dominic Cruz can do when fighting inside the pocket. I don't. I think Henry Cejudo is fearless. I don't think Henry Cejudo, in his own mind, thinks. Okay, here's the thing. If you dive into a, the reason, like a lot of my friends say this thing, I'll say this all the time. Hey, why can't Fighter A just go inside and knock out Fighter B? Why can't he just like run in front of him? And the reason is, is because in most cases, especially in the heavyweight division. And the more heavier divisions, the counter punchers always, the counter punchers always win. That's how it is. Dominic Cruz, yes, although he's a good counter puncher, he is a good counter puncher when fighting outside the pocket. So, Henry Cejudo's like, okay, I just have to counter punch him and go inside his, and go inside his pocket when he tries to dive into me, and I can go and hit him with, and I can go knock him out. That really is the best strategy for Henry Cejudo. Henry Cejudo should not be afraid of Dominic Cruz's knockout power because the truth is Dominic Cruz doesn't have knockout power. He doesn't. You just have to take the you just have to take the damage really. You just have to Henry Cejudo has to risk getting hurt, get, getting hurt, but understand that the pain he's going to go through from getting hurt from Dominic Cruz strikes isn't going to overwhelm to the point of him getting knocked out. So Henry Cejudo if he is like okay, I gotta go dive into to Dominic Cruz. I just have to toughen up and take whatever punches he's gonna give me. And if I can lay one good like one good left uh, left hook on him, I win this fight. That's how Henry Soto is gonna win this fight, and that's why I predict really. I predict these two fight uh, these two fighters go uh, going in. You know, Dominic Cruz will do his thing where he's gonna go bounce around. He's gonna move. He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna constantly keep Henry Soto uh, thinking of what's gonna happen. Dominic Cruz is gonna overwhelm him with some strikes, but. In a scenario to which Dominic Cruz is going to do a three punch combo or a four punch combo where he comes in from outside the pocket, coming into Henry Cejudo's pocket, Cejudo is going to go press forward. He's going to lunge in as Cruz is lunging him, lunging in himself. It's going to, it's going to, uh, it's going to confuse Cruz. Henry Cejudo is going to go for a left haymaker onto Cruz. Cruz is going to go in, go for some ground and pound. And yes, although Cruz has a good jiu-jitsu game, I can guarantee you, no matter how much training you have, for wrestling and for grappling, you are not going to match Henry Cejudo. You're not. The guy is a gold medalist for a reason in amateur wrestling. And so, Henry Cejudo, he does a left haymaker, knocks down Dominic Cruz. He goes in, uh, goes in for a double leg takedown and starts ground and pounding Cruz. So, from what I, from how I'm, what I think is going to happen, it's either, I think Henry Cejudo is going to defeat Dominic Cruz in the second round, uh, in the second, in the second round, um, uh, in the second round by TKO. That's my final prediction. Henry Cejudo defeats Dominic Cruz in the se- in the early of second round for a TKO victory. Now, I also predict Henry Cejudo maybe doing a TKO victory on towards Dominic Cruz early on. I think Henry Cejudo will be like, you know what? S- screw this, like me thinking of when is the right time for me to strike. I'm just gonna do it right now. Uh, I'm just gonna do it right now. That that's what I think Henry Cejudo's like process might be. So it might either be a first round TKO or a second round TKO to which Henry Cejudo. 
um, uh, uh, does a knockdown on Cruz and, uh, and goes for a ground and pound. So it's either first or second round. I don't see this fight ending by decision. If it does end by decision, then there's a chance that Cruz can win this fight. But overall, though, if um, if Henry Cejudo stay, remains to be aggressive, and if Cruz fights his style, as he's accustomed, which is him fighting very passive, him fighting very quick, him trying to confuse his, opponent, uh, his opponents through quickness, and Henry Cejudo, uh, Henry Cejudo, if he has the patience, uh, if he has the patience, and he has the know-it-all of like, okay, when is the right time for me to lunge in forward, or when is the right time for me to press forward, and for me to take a couple punches to the face in order for me to go get the knockdown or the takedown? So coming up after a short break here, we just talked about the, the main event and the co-main event. Let's talk about the other fights here, including Greg Hardy, Francis Ngannou, and Calvin Guitar, right here at the GSMC MMA Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. And welcome back here. So we got Francis Ngannou versus Gisano Rosenstrike. Who's going to win this bout? It's definitely going to be uh, Francis Ngannou here. And that's not me discrediting Rosenstrike. Ngannou's coming to this fight 14-3, and while Rosenstrike is coming in this fight 10-0. and And when I look back, a fighter is as good as their last performance. And so when I look at Francis Ngannou and his last performance against uh, Curtis Blades here, yes, Ngannou has had really bad performances Against the PMO, not really necessarily a bad performance against Mio Church, just Mio Church was a better fighter. It is, uh, and Gunny had a very bad performance against, uh, versus Derek Lewis, and that performance has stung a wee bit about the mystique of Nganu. Because even when Ngannou was fighting against uh, Stipe Miocic, a lot of people were predicting Ngannou to defeat Miocic, actually. A lot of people were like, oh man, Ngannou, he's the future, he's gonna knock out Miocic. And when Miocic defeated Ngannou, it then became Ngannou versus Derek Lewis, and we're thinking, okay, this will be a big bounce back victory here for Ngannou. He's going to go knock out Derek Lewis. Stylistically, the matchup is in favor for Francis Ngannou to defeat Derek Lewis. And yes, <laughs> and then it was Ngannou versus Lewis. And like, to be honest, I kind of forgot who won that fight because that fight was without a doubt the most, one, one of the most boring fights I've ever gone to witness. I think that fight had the record for least punches ever thrown in a fight. So, uh, which, uh, yeah, like that surpassed Wonder Boy versus Tyron Woodley in their second exchange in terms of, like most boring fight ever. But yeah, Ngannou versus Derek Lewis, yeah, that that fight was so awful to watch. It was so boring to watch that the mystique behind Ngannou being like the most feared man in all of UFC pretty much got away until Ngannou fight Curtis Blades, but it was Ngannou versus Curtis Blades too. And in in that fight, and we saw we saw. The old Francis Ngannou, really. We did. We saw this guy who was known for knocking out people in the first round. And not only that, Ngannou was very precise in the striking. For the most part, Ngannou mostly relies on his overwhelming power and like his dangerous right hook to go and knock out people. He is inc- he's an incredibly powerful man. But oh my, oh my, but oh my gosh, in his fight against Curtis Blades, he was a lot more clean. He was a lot more tight in his boxing. And when you follow Francis Ngannou's uh, training camp, his coach says that Ngannou, going forward, is pushing less on the idea of being this power striker and being this dude who's, who relies mostly on for his power shots from through win fights. Ngannou is now transitioning from being primarily a power striker into being a well adept boxer who's going who's going for angled shots, who will take his time, who has better cardio. Because that was Ngannou's two biggest weaknesses: is that he was the most cleanest fighter to watch in terms of boxing. And his cardio was awful. And so now, pushing forward, especially after the Curtis Blaze fight, Ngannou is now going towards, okay, no more of this. I'm still going to be the big, powerful stri- striker. I'll, I'll still be the guy who can knock you out with one punch. 
but I'm also going to fight a lot more smarter, a lot more cleaner. I'm going to go pick my shots a lot more. I'll be a lot more patient. And you will think, okay, a fighter who's fighting a lot more safe and a lot more passive would be boring, but not really because Ngannou still has his striking because he still has that par- like power in him. It just he's got he's a lot more quicker, and also he's a lot more like his precision striking is a lot more better now. And so Ngannou, I think as a fighter, has improved significantly a lot. And and Ghana went through that weird phase that a lot of fighters go through, like Rose Namino sometimes with Lee and uh, Ben Askren and stuff, where after you go after you go off a really bad loss and there's a lot of like people from the media like talking down to you, people on social media talking about how bad how bad you were in that performance. And Ghana was like, Hey man, I don't really love MMA anymore. I really don't. But now, recently, for the past two months, and Ghana's been pushing the idea that he should go fight Miocic or Daniel Cormier again. I don't know, he should fight he should fight, yeah, yeah, yeah. He should go fight Miocic again for a title shot instead of Daniel Cormier. And so, if Miocic were to defeat Daniel Cormier, and then it would be Nganu versus Miocic, and Nganu this time says, you know what? I am ready this time. I came into the fight with a bad strategy, but now I've tightened up my boxing a lot more. I'm a lot more better on my cardio. I'm not just out there throwing out these wild haymakers. I am now going to be a better boxer, a better all around MMA fighter. And that what that is what Engano is like working on, and so I'm talking about Engano a lot here. Well, what about Rosenstrike? Well, the reason why I'm not talking about Rosenstrike that much, although he is 10 and 0, when you look at Rosenstrike's performance uh, against Alistair Overeem, you have to compare his performance along with Engano's performance on Overeem. So, how was Engano versus Over Overeem? How is that matchup working well? Well, Engano, Engano now is a better striker than he was when he fought Alistair Overeem. So, it, knowing that though, Rosenstrike has to have a much more impressive performance in that Alistair Overeem fight to supersede Ngannou's performance. And I didn't really, th- and I didn't really see that. I saw Overeem winning that fight. Overeem was defeating Rosenstrike for the majority of that fight, going for clinches, going for takedowns. Alistair Overeem's striking was a lot more cleaner, a lot more better, a lot. It, it, uh, Overeem felt more comfortable fighting Rosenstrike than he did fighting his Ngannou. And then and and then Rosenstrike was able to close out the distance here, uh, throwing a couple uh, throwing a couple of jabs here and then knock out Overeem, which is impressive and it came out of nowhere. Most people didn't predict Rosenstrike defeating Overeem, and when you were to see that fight, if you were to look at the if you were to look at like the first two rounds and be like, okay, there's like no chance Rosenstrike is going to defeat Overeem because Overeem's got him in every single aspect of this game. And then and then Rosenstrike actually knocks out Overeem. You're like, wow, what the heck did not see that coming? Wow. Uh, it's, there are some red flags in that Rosenstrike, um, Alistair Overeem fight, which is why I myself am not that confident in the matchup, really, of Rosenstrike with Ngannou, because that performance that Rosenstrike had, although, yes, he knocked out Alistair Overeem in terms of, in sort of, like, rec- like name recognition, probably the biggest fight of his entire night, of his entire career, but still, like, that performance, if you're to measure it with Ngannou's performance against Overeem, I don't think it really holds up that well, considering the fact that we now know Ngannou is a better striker now than he did when he fought Overeem for the first time. And so, Ngannou versus Rose Strike, where do I predict, predict this fight happening? So, this fight can be, potentially, it's a, it, it's a heavy, heavy, heavyweight fights have the tendency of doing this, in that they might be the most boring fight of the entire night, or it might be the most fastest fight of the entire night. For all we know, this fight could end in 30 seconds. Really can. It could either end with Rosenstrike knocking out Ngannou or Ngannou knocking Rosenstrike within 30 seconds. Or, or let's cross your fingers this doesn't happen. It becomes this boring fight where it's not even really a slugfest and two really big beefy dudes looking at each other and throwing out these very weak jabs that are not going to put a dent in a birthday cake and it becomes boring and Ngannou wins the fight via decision. With the, when, there's no crowd there booing, so, there's no crowd there booing, so these fighters are gonna be focused and they're not gonna be pressured into doing anything stupid or dumb. Ah, uh, man, I'm hoping this fight becomes exciting and interesting. I really, I really do. With Ngano fights, they either become like super boring and you just don't wanna watch it, or it becomes like, wow, oh my gosh, Ngano, this guy deserves a title shot, this guy could be the face of the UFC, wow! There's no middle ground with Francis. And so hopefully through this fight, we'll see how much Francis Ngannou has improved against Rosenstrike. And we can see whether or not Rosenstrike, his performance against Alistair Overeem was a complete fluke or not. Was it a fluke or was it really him just being a better fighter that night? And maybe Rosenstrike should go. Because he's like, whoever wins this fight 
pretty much gets first buy. And whoever, yeah, whoever wins this fight will either fight Fabrizio Verdum if he were to defeat Alaske Alenek, uh, uh, Alenek or fight against Cormier or Miocic. Either way, winner of Rosa Strike for Singano puts you right in the forefront of potentially getting a title fight either by the end of this year or probably sometime next year. So this is a major fight for both of these fighters. The loser of this fight, very likely, is not going to be in in title fight talks for about the next two years. Yeah, for about the next two years. But this coming in from BJPen.com that Rosenstreich says that I'm going to make this one of the best fights of 2020. I am going to get a knockout win. I have to. That's the only thing that counts. I've trained so hard. I have to win this fight. Rosenstreich explained I'll KO him in the second round, but don't be surprised if I knock him out in the first round just to get this win and look forward to the future. Not only that, from Francis Ngannou's camp, he himself is also predicting a KO. He's um he's expressed vehemently about how frustrated he about how frustrated he is that he should be in the front in front of the line in the heavyweight division. And we got a lot of um analysts here in sports websites saying that Ngannou is the favorite here and is predicted that Ngannou is gonna knock out Rosenstrike. So, from Nganu's camp, he says he's going to let it all out there. He's going to go, we're going to see the best version of Nganu. And then from Rosenstrike's camp, we're saying, hey man, this guy could potentially knock him out in the first round. Possibly early in the second round. So, I expect fireworks from both of these fight from both of these fighters. But, I'm not going to put my, my hopes up that held high. I'm not going to put it up that high. So coming up after the short break here, we'll be discussing Jeremy Stevens versus Captain Guitar, which I genuinely believe will be the dark horse fight of the night. That's what my belief is. Coming up after the short break, right here at the GSMC MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And welcome back here. So we got two fights over here. Jeremy Stevens versus Kevin Guitar and Greg Hardy versus Jorgen Castro. I'm not I'm not I'm gonna talk about both of these fights here. Uh first off, Jeremy Stevens versus Kevin Guitar. This fight is my dark horse pick for being fight of the night, really. And the reason for that is because Jeremy Stevens okay, okay, Jeremy Stevens and Kevin Guitar, they stylistically match up with each other perfectly. <laughs> they really do. Uh so Steve, so my three like potential Father Knights here would be Jeremy Stevens versus Calvin Guitar, Tony Burgers versus Gaethje, and Ngannou versus Rosenstrike. Rosenstrike versus Ngannou, that could be a really really boring fight. Ferguson versus Gaethje. The reason why I'm kind of skeptical on that, skeptical on that, is because, <laughs> because I, I there always is in the past um, major UFC fights, UFC events here. There are always these uh, there are always these fights that end up. Ending in either blood stoppage or a doctor stoppage or like something happening that that makes that kind of tones down the fight. And that Ferguson versus Anthony Pettis fight. When I was watching that, me and my friends we were like, "Oh my gosh, this was an insane fight ever! This was just really fun." And then the fight ends via blood stoppage. And considering the fact that Ferguson always has a tendency of using his elbows when it comes to the clinching, he loves doing that. And also the fact that Justin Gaethje is a walking tank and he doesn't defend himself all that well in the head all that much when it comes to the striking exchanges. I can see this fight end via doctor stoppage. It's it's it would be bad if it did, but because of that, I'm like you know what? For as fun as Ferguson versus Gaethje can be, that fight could potentially end in a doctor stoppage, and that's why I'm like iffy about that. And in Gondor versus Rosenstrike, Strike, that fight could end via the most boring way possible, where we got two fighters out there who are just too intimidated to strike with each other. Hopefully that doesn't happen. And then we got Jeremy Stevens versus Calvin Guitar. One thing about I love about Jeremy Stevens, which really I shouldn't like, is the fact that Jeremy Stevens hasn't changed his fighting style in over ten years. Like if you if you brought Jeremy Stevens from ten years ago and you bring him to now, absolutely nothing has changed with the striking. Absolutely nothing. Jeremy Stevens is a fighter that fits perfectly well with an era of like like like, like John Fix, uh, Fitch, Sean Shirk. Uh, Sean Shirk, uh, Clay Guida, he, he's like that fighter from like the late 2000s, early 2000s, uh, early 2010s UFC of that, uh, of that side. We're like, they're really good at like one thing 
but like they're like mediocre at best with everything else. And the one thing Jeremy Stevens is kind of good at, kind of good at now, would be his striking, kind of. And when I say kind of, it's in the sense that Jeremy Stevens still obviously has a lot of power and he has a lot of confidence in his power. He still believes he he is one of the hardest hitting fighters in the entire featherweight division. I think he could potentially knock out anyone. Now his striking defense, though, that leaves a lot to be left desired. Though when I look at both of these fighters, I look at the performances that Calvin Qatar had against the Beat and how Jeremy Stevens had against Yarigas. And I look at those two. Kevin Guitar came out of that fight against the Beats a lot more better than a lot of people thought. So when it was the Beat versus Kevin Guitar, the initial prediction was the Beat is just going to decimate Kevin Guitar. Uh, although the Beat doesn't isn't necessarily the best power striker in the in the UFC, his unique strike, his unique striking. He, oh, here's the Beat comes across as like a street fighter or Tekken character from a video game. Throwing out like like uh, crazy reverse kicks, crazy tornado kicks, doing these like, axe kicks. Like the beats move set, it has to be one of the most coolest move sets out there in the UFC, other than Israel Desanya. And then when Zabit is like slowly decimating Kevin Qatar for the first two rounds, there are brief instances where Zabit could have lost that fight, with Kevin Qatar just muscling, powering his strike, kind of like Justin Gaethje actually, where he's powering through everything that's being given to him. Man. And to be honest with you, if the fight were a five round were a five round fight of Zabit versus Calvin Guitar. Calvin could have won that fight, but because it was only three rounds, um, although Calvin won the third round, Zabit won the first two rounds. But if you were to go an extra add and, and add an extra fourth and fifth round, Calvin Guitar could have won that fight. Now compared to Jeremy Stevens versus Yara Rodriguez, no, <laughs> uh, no, um, Yara Rodriguez knocked out uh, knocks out Jeremy Stevens. And when I look at Qatar versus Stevens. The reason why I think this could be a potential fight of the night here is off the basis that both fighters are absolutely, ha- absolutely have no fear. Even though Stevens has been knocked out several times, even though uh, Kevin Qatar has a te- uh, has a tendency of losing all of his bouts due to him putting himself in a bad position of like trying to go inside the pocket and fight against other strikers in their game, still this fight can go either way, and both fighters are. This is why I say this really, like, out of every fight in this entire card, these two have the most perfect matchup against each other. Because both of them pretty much fight the same way, to an extent. Uh, to an extent, except I think Calvin Qatar is more of a cardio freak than Jeremy Stevens. While well, Jeremy Stevens has a lot more power, but Calvin Qatar has a lot more cle- is a lot more cleaner in his striking ability. Jeremy Stevens, in his recent five fights, he is... He is 1-3-1 and one in his past fights. And there's reason, and there's a reason for that. Is because Jeremy Stevens, for as good as a striker he is, he tends to be very passive at times. Like he tries to go for, he tries to be a headhunter when he really shouldn't be a headhunter. And when he and when he tries to go for a head, tries to be a headhunter, and he's like overthinking of when he should go place his strikes. He has a tendency of lowering his guard down, and then he himself gets knocked out or gets a knockdown. So when I look at Jeremy Stevens versus Kevin Guitar, I think Kevin Guitar his fighting style is a lot more patient than Jeremy Stevens. Qatar was able to go toe-to-toe against Zabit, and you need to have a lot of patience to figure out the right angles on how to go get uh, Zabit, because Zabit's one of the most unique fighters out there in the UFC. So, uh, Qatar, from how I predict this fight happening, Jeremy Stevens and, and, and Qatar, they're going to they're gonna look at each other, Jeremy Stevens is going to go in, he's going to fight a, l- a little bit safe, he's going to go in immediately for some right hooks and right haymakers, uh, Qatar is going to go block all the shots, I don't see Qatar getting knocked out from Jeremy Stevens. But I see Qatar coming in early in the second round. My early in the second round uh, um, is outstriking Jeremy Stevens. That's my prediction. I don't think it's gonna go by decision. But if it were to go by decision, I would say unanimous decision. Calvin Qatar. Um, if it were to go by a TKO victory, I don't see Stevens knocking out Qatar. I see Ka- Calvin Qatar enduring whatever Jeremy Stevens gives to him. And although Jeremy Stevens is really strong, Qatar can go and handle himself inside, inside and outside the pocket. Is able to pick out his shots and is able to wear down Jeremy Stevens. Um, by end of the first round, or by end of the first round, or beginning of early second round. So Qatar got some, he has my pick over there. Then Greg Hardy versus Jorgen DeCaster. Greg Hardy coming off his first loss in the UFC. Definitely a humbling experience for Greg Hardy. Greg Hardy is really is. Uh, so I, Greg Hardy is that fighter that a lot of um, other the, the veterans, the journeyman fighters, uh, have issues with in the fact that Greg Hardy really isn't the best fighter. He really isn't. He's not the most. He's not the most um, interesting or exciting fighters to watch in the sense that 
what he's doing is clean. Because when you look at the skill, because obviously, obviously Greg Hardy, he's a football player coming to UFC. So when you look at the skill level of Greg Hardy towards like fighters like Yara Rodriguez, Dominic Cruz, uh, Tony Ferguson, uh, Calvin Guitar, yeah, Greg Hardy is like, oh my god, this guy's fights like, sl- like very sloppy. Like he fights very sloppy. There are obvious holes in his games. And when Greg Hardy lost in his last fights, it was shown that he has a lot of holes in his game and Greg Hardy has a lot to work on. But Greg Hardy truly is a freak athlete. He is a legitimate athlete, and he can. And once he gets, if he can get his training dial, uh, done dialed down, he can truly defeat anybody in the UFC if the training helps him out. And so Greg Hardy is coming into the fight against Jorgen Castro. Jorgen, Ta- Jorgen de Castro. Jorgen de Castro. I I don't really see him winning. Uh, him winning all the fight. Greg Hardy is coming into this fight as the major favorite here. And in this fight, here, I choose Greg Hardy. I think Greg Hardy. Might either win this fight through first round decision, or you're going to, or you're going to Castro is gonna completely um destroy Greg Hardy th- through smart fighting here. Um, Greg Hardy is my pick to win this fight against Jurgen Castro. So he, and so by the end in the main card, I predict Tony Ferguson defeating Justin Gaethje. I predict Henry Cejudo defeating Dominic Cruz. I predict, I predict Francis Ngannou versus Rosenstrike. And and Ghana winning. I predict Calvin Guitar defeating Jeremy Stevens, and I pick Greg Hardy defeating Jurgen Castro. For the most part, the prediction and betting odds are in favor of what I am predicting. The interesting, though, what makes this very interesting, though, is that through the rest of the card here, we've got a lot of great fights. We got Don Cerrone versus Anthony Pettis, Alex Golenek versus Producer Verdum, Carlos Sparza versus Michelle Watterson, Uriah Hall versus Ronaldo, uh, Ronaldo Souza. A lot of fun fights uh, at the prelims here. And so, uh, when you look at the, here's the thing, the prelim, the, the prelim fight with Sorin versus Anthony Perez, Verdun Olenek, Ospaza, Michelle Watson, all these fights could potentially be a co-main event, uh, could all be a co-main event or main event for a UFC Fight Night card or a UFC on ESPN card. So, expect a lot of fun fights, uh, if you're, if you're going to this UFC show, I mean, if you're gonna watch this UFC show and you're thinking, oh man, only the main card fight is the only one that matters, Trust me, you're going to see a lot of fun fights, even down to the early prelim fights here with Vincent LeQuente versus Nico Price, Bryce Mitchell versus Charles, uh, Charles Rosa. You're going to see a lot of fun fights here. I can guarantee you that. And so coming up right after the shirt break here, we'll be looking at the preliminary card here. To be honest with you, if you're just watching the UFC show, UFC 249, for just the main card, you are missing out on the prelim card. Headline with Don Cerny versus Anthony Pennis, I can guarantee you that fight is going to be really fun. And who knows, maybe that fight could be the fight of the night. This entire UFC 249 card is full of fight other night contenders from prelims to main card. Coming back after the short break. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And welcome back. So let's look at the preliminary card. This will be on ESPN. We got Don Cerrone versus Anthony Pettis. LSK Olenek versus the returning Rubicio Verdum. Carlos Sparza versus Michelle Watterson. Uriah Hall versus Ronaldo Jacare Souza. We got four fights here that are really fun. Uh, any of these four fights could be the main card. To be honest with you, these four fights could really could be the main event or a co-main event for a UFC fight night. Or for a UFC on an ESPN card because these fights are going to be really fun. So if you're expecting just to watch the main card, I recommend you watch the prelims card. It'll be really enjoyable. So Uriah Hall versus Jacare Ronaldo Souza. I predict here uh, Ronaldo Souza defeating Uriah Hall. If you look at Uriah Hall's last pre- uh, last uh, fr- um, previous performances, Uriah Hall is coming off like fighting incredibly passive than it really should be. Uriah Hall has always been a fighter with a whole lot of potential, and as time has continued on. That potential is weighing down. Ronaldo Zosa is consistent as all heck. And if you watch his most rep- uh, recent performances that Zosa has, which was he had a performance of the night bonus in his last fight, uh, Zosa really is a cardio machine, and he's got and, he, and he's got great chin, and his wrestling ability is easily going to overwhelm Uriah Hall. Uriah Hall, as good of a striker as he is, he has not developed that ground uh, that ground game. That I feel like if he were to get that, he would easily be among the top ten in the middleweight division. So I say Ronaldo Jacare Zosa is going to defeat Uriah Hall. By decision, I say for decision to which Uriah Zosa is going to go and wrestle Uriah Hall for three rounds. Women's strawweight bout here, and it is Carlos Sparza versus Michelle Watterson. This is going to be a very interesting fight here. Winner of this fight possibly has a has a chance to um, bleeding their way into the top five 
of the very stacked women's starweight division. Uh, Michelle Watterson is recently coming off a loss against Yohan Chechek, to which, and when if you look at that fight there, Michelle Watterson came in that fight with the wrong strategy. She really did. Uh, so, Yohan's best, Yohan fights similar to Dominic Cruz in the sense that they both rely on out-of-pocket boxing, uh, boxing to go win out their fights. They prefer the grind-out, out-of-pocket boxing game, and they try to avoid the 50-50 exchanges. And so, what does Michelle Watterson do? Uh, she, uh, she fights Yohan Chechek style that she much prefers. For some reason, she was gonna, go, she's, she's going for like high kicks. She's going for like low kicks, even though she's not within range. She's trying to go and jab out Yoana Chechek, even though her length reach doesn't match up that to Yoana. She's trying to avoid all the 50-50 exchanges. She's doing everything that Rose Nama Yunus and Wally Zhang did in their performances against Yoana Chechek. And because of that, I say to Michelle Watterson, she fought really poorly against Yoana and her cornermen should be ashamed of themselves because they should have strategized a lot more better fighting against Yoana. And then we see Carlos Esparza here, who recently had a who, who's coming off a, a two a two fight victory, two fight win streak. So Michelle Watterson is coming off one loss, while Carlos Esparza is coming off two wins. Carlos Esparza has improved dramatically in her boxing a lot. The biggest knock on Carlos Esparza is the fact that although she is a really great wrestler, her striking ability leaves a lot to be left desired. And although her wrestling is really good within the women's division, her inability to like take advantage of fighters in within the clinch or within it gets to close range 50 50, uh, 50, 50 exchanges, Carlos Esparza tends to have her brain be turned off and she tends to struggle. In that scenario, but in her last two victories, upon trying to go for the single leg takedown, she's also going for clinches, going for some under, for, going for some dirty boxing, and her dirty boxing has improved significantly a lot, which leads to her having more easier attempts, a lot, uh, allowing her to do better in the takedowns, and for her scoring points and defeating her opponents. So, although momentum is currently carrying over from Carla Esparza to Michelle Waters, uh, uh, to, to the Michelle Waterson fight, I still predict Michelle Waterson defeating Carla Esparza. Because Michelle Watterson has all the skills, all the tools, and all the abilities to go defeat the majority of the women in the women's strawweight division. But the thing, though, is that Michelle Watterson's camp, her corner, they're giving her the wrong strategy. They're giving her the wrong game plan. And if Michelle Watterson comes into the fight uh, with the right game plan, I think she will go defeat Carlos Esparza. And when I say the right game plan, what I mean, though, is that Michelle Watterson has to fight keep away against Carlos Esparza. And also, work, and Michelle Watterson has to work a lot on towards her jiu-jitsu ground game. Michelle Watterson has a really good underrated jiu-jitsu ground game that I think a lot of people seem to underestimate how good Watterson is. Watterson really is a, a complete MMA fighter. It's just the fact that Michelle Watterson doesn't really necessarily excel in one specific category. If you're talking about what is her best skill, what is her best ability in her MMA game, it would definitely be her ground game, her reverse wrestling, her jiu-jitsu, her jiu-jitsu game. Her boxing game has improved a lot though, but not to the point that it will, that is deemed a major threat to the top contenders of the women's strike division. But I think it's good enough to go and stop uh, a person like Carlos Esparza. So when I look at Carlos Esparza versus Michelle Watterson, um, if Michelle Watterson fights very patient in this fight and mostly relies on out-of-the-pocket boxing to go and slow down Carlos Esparza, Michelle Watterson should win this fight via points. Because I, in, in, really, Esparza versus Watterson, I predict this fight going down by points, really. Uh, Sparza, for as much as she's improved in her striking, she doesn't have the she doesn't have the punching power to go and stop Michelle Watterson. Even her ground game isn't as strong enough to go stop somebody who's as skilled as, Mich- as Michelle Watterson. So, if Watterson can go keep outside the pocket and go box uh, Sparza, and if Sparza were to go take her down, Michelle Watterson's jiu-jitsu game um, uh, gives her the gives her the edge in in defending herself. I said Watterson's going to win this fight via decision. But if Esparza can go dive in there, uh, make Michelle Watterson very uncomfortable with, uh, with the clinching, which Watterson has a tendency of struggling in, then Esparza is going to win that uh, that scenario. So in Esparza versus Watterson, I say Watterson is going to win this fight if she were to come to the fight with the right strategy and if she's fully prepared. I expect her to be fully prepared. But if she's not, I say Carlos Esparza is going to overwhelm Michelle Watterson. So it can go either way, but I say it's going to end up in a unanimous decision victory. The first round is going to speak on what, what's going to happen in the second and third round. Whoever wins the first round is going to win the second and third round. That's my prediction. And then Fabrizio Verdum is making his return from suspension against Aleski Olenek. And surprising enough, though, there's a lot of people betting on Fabrizio Verdum to defeat Olenek. And I'm telling you right now, Olenek is a tough... He's a tough hombre. He, he, he can definitely defeat Verdum 100% about there. Verdum is coming off, um, is coming off his suspension though, so there is ring rust there. Uh, the way you look at Verdum versus Olenek is very similar to how you look at Dominic Cruz versus Henry Cejudo in the sense that how much does ring rust play into your come, into your comeback fight here? Uh, Verdum, Verdum has been gone for about a year and a half, 
uh, for about a year and a half from the UFC. And Verdum in his most recent uh, uh, fight wasn't all that impressive, really. And compared to Olenek, Olenek's performance against Maurice Green was really well. And I recommend all you guys to watch that fight. He definitely made some adjustments um, in the fight uh, with Maurice Green compared to the adjustments he had to deal with against Walt Harris and Alistair Overeem. So I say... You know what? Olenek definitely has a chance against uh, Fabrizio Verdum here. Yes, both fighters are, are both fighters are really good submission fighters. Verdum defeats Olenek in a stand-up game, obviously. Uh, Olenek's, stri- uh, Olenek's striking stand-up game isn't all that well. And if Verdum can close in a distance and overwhelm Olenek, I say Verdum can even can potentially defeat Olenek in the first round. That's why a lot of people are betting on Verdum to go win this. But... You know what? That um, the ring rust. It's a major part as to re- as to why I don't think Dominic Cruz is going to be Henry Cejudo. And so, off the basis of ring rust, I'm going to say Olenek is going to go and tap out for BC Verdum by the end of the first round. That is my prediction. If not, I see Verdum knocking out Olenek in the first round. So it's either uh, first round uh, first round submission victory for Olenek or first round K- K- TKO by Verdum. Uh, my money is going to go on Olenek because a uh, ring rust is a major part of why I don't really believe Verdum is prepped up. And ready to fight somebody with the caliber as a Linux. And then finally, the main event of the prelim card. It's going to be Don Cerrone versus Anthony Pettis. This is coming off a rematch to with Anthony Pettis. Completely tear down Don Cerrone with his, with his body kicks and liver shots. And when you look at, when you look at the past five performances of Anthony Pettis versus the past five performances of Don Cerrone, Don Cerrone edges Anthony Pettis out a lot because, uh, um, both of these fighters are coming off, um, uh, are coming off losses. Both, fi- uh, both fighters are definitely not in the prime of their career anymore. They're both pretty much journeymen at this moment. Anthony Pettis has not, hasn't really recovered since losing the belt, uh, since losing, since, uh, losing his title, uh, a couple years ago. And then Don Cerrone, his performance against Conor McGregor is a major red flag in, in the sense that Don Cerrone has said himself that he didn't felt right going into that fight. So really, this could be a complete toss-up. Are we gonna uh, we're gonna see Anthony Pettis versus, uh, versus Don Cerrone here? Whoever shows up is the one who's gonna win the fight. Um, from Anthony Pettis's corner, from his, from his camp, and compared to Don Cerrone's camp, both camps are saying that both fighters are doing the best that they can, and they're gonna have a much more better performance for this upcoming fight compared to their more recent performances. And so for Don Cerrone versus Anthony Pettis, this complete this can be a complete toss-up here. Are we gonna see Don Cerrone or are we gonna see Cowboy Don Cerrone? Are we gonna see Anthony Pettis, the guy? Who has unlimited potential, or we're gonna see Anthony Pettis, the journeyman here. This is a complete toss-up. I say Don Cerrone is gonna win this fight because once again, looking at both fighters' past five performances, Anthony Pettis looks like it's going a wee bit down, while Don Cerrone is going up and down. And because of that, I see Don Cerrone is gonna go win this fight. I have no clue if it's gonna end by decision or by knockout. I say it's gonna be a drag out war, three rounds. That's my prediction there. UFC 249 is this Saturday, and it'll be the return of mixed martial arts in the midst of COVID-19, and I can't wait for it. Since so, thank you for listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I can ask you, please remember to subscribe to this show and write a nice review. That really helps up. Also, you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.